Are you afraid of the Morris Minor wiring loom? Don't be afraid of your wiring loom. It's actually pretty easy. If you've ever looked closely at your loom, you'll know the wires are colour-coded. In theory, it's possible to find them on a circuit diagram and figure out what they do. In theory. This is the circuit diagram from a Haynes manual. You can see it's not easy to read. The type is small and not very clear. Of course, the Haynes manuals are printed in black and white, so the colours of the wires aren't even shown. Instead, they're lettered to show the colour. U means blue, N means brown, and so on. Clear so far? Probably not. You'll also see the electrical components aren't labelled. Instead, they've got a number which you have to look up. To top it off, it's not even accurate. The wire to the oil pressure light is shown as green and yellow. In fact, it should be green and brown. So that's all clear as mud. I got confused as well, so I drew up my own diagrams and tried to make them easy to follow. There's a link to download them in the video description. I'm not claiming any copyright, so feel free to share or upload them as you like. The main wires and the loom have solid colours. They're shown at the bottom of the diagram. For instance, solid green means a wire that is only live if the ignition is turned on and its fuse protected. A lot of the wires have a second colour added. The main colour is called the body colour and the second colour is called the tracer. For example, the indicator wires have a green body colour because they come on with the ignition and they're fused, but the left-hand indicators are green with a red tracer and the right-hand ones are green with a white tracer. About now, you might be wondering why this video is called Secrets of the Morris Minor Wiring Loom. After all, colour codes aren't much of a secret. But here's something you might not know. Almost all British cars of the period used the same colour codes. For instance, the miner used green and red for the left-hand indicators, as we've seen. Here's a circuit for a Hillman Minx. The left-hand indicators also use green and red. Ford console, green and red. Morgan Plus 4, green and red. And so on. Of course, auto electricians of the time knew all the colours by heart, so they could work on almost any car, even if they hadn't seen one before and had no circuit diagram. So, where did these colours come from? The main manufacturer of vehicle electrical components at the time was Lucas, otherwise known as Lucas, Prince of Darkness. And they published a list of recommended colour codes. The British Standards Institution also issued a document, trendily called BSAU7, which is almost identical. Where possible, you should always use the correct colour of wiring for any repair or modification. There's nothing more confusing than using the wrong colours. So, what colours do we use for non-standard editions? One of the great benefits of BSAU7 is it has colours for equipment not fitted as standard to the miner. For instance, reversing lights should use a green cable with a brown tracer. The green, of course, uh, tells us that it should get its power from a fused ignition circuit. OK, but where do we get these coloured wires from? Most of the good suppliers have them. Here's a page from the Car Builder Solutions catalogue. They supply by the meter, so you can buy just what you want. There's no need to buy whole drums. But there's a much cheaper way if you just want a few lengths of the standard colours. Get an old wiring harness on eBay or from your local scrapyard. It doesn't even need to be from a Morris Minor. Any vehicle that used the standard colours will do. Harnesses tend to deteriorate from the ends. The connectors corrode and you may get a bit of moisture entry to the first half inch or so of the insulation, but strip the harness, cut the ends off, and you should have a good supply of perfectly serviceable coloured wires. Now we need to connect them up. There are two main types of connector. Spade connectors, which look like spades, and bullet connectors, which look like, well, you get the idea. 
Original factory spade connectors look like this. Technically, they are uninsulated terminals, but they have a slip-on cover of clear plastic. You can still buy them. There are other, more modern, ready-insulated connectors available, but they don't look right, particularly under the bonnet. They may even lose you points in a concourse event. There are a couple of variations on the spade connector. For instance, ring connectors, which are usually used for bolting earth leads to the body, and piggyback connectors, which allow more than one spade connector to be connected to the same place. The Morris Miner uses 6.3mm spade connectors, and there are generally two types for the two main wire sizes. The spade connector has two sets of lugs. One set grips the bare wire, and the other grips the insulation to provide additional mechanical strength. To fit a spade terminal, we first slide the cover onto the wire, then we strip off about 4mm of the insulation. There are a number of different crimping tools. This is a fancy one that has a stepped jaw to crimp both sets of lugs at the same time. First we put the connector into the crimping tool and close it lightly to hold it. Insert the wire and then we tighten it up firmly to complete the join. Of course there are other tools that can do the crimp in two stages. You can even use pliers or a blunt set of side cutters if you're careful, but they aren't ideal. You can also solder spade connectors, but it shouldn't be necessary. The original looms weren't soldered and some of them are fine after half a century of use. You should be able to push the spade connector onto the blade by hand. If it's an old one and a bit loose, slide the cover back and nip it with a pair of pliers. But if there is any doubt, cut it off and replace it. You should be able to remove a spade connector by hand, but grip the connector itself. Don't pull on the wire. In the worst case, slide the cover off and pull on it with a pair of pliers. If the blade is corroded, you can clean it up with a bit of fine wet and dry paper, then give it just a slight wipe with WD-40. It won't affect the connection. If the spade itself is significantly corroded, it's best to snip it off and replace it. Properly done, this should only shorten the wire by 4 or 5 millimetres, so it won't be a problem as long as you don't go crazy. Bullet connectors are used for joining wires together. The brass bit is the terminal and the tubular bit is the connector. The Morris Miner uses 4.8 millimetre bullets. The terminals come with different sized holes for different wire gauges. This is a bullet crimping tool. We strip off about 5 millimetres of the wire insulation, put the bullet terminal into the tool, insert the wire and crimp it tight. Again, you can use other tools or even pliers if you're careful. The connectors are brass tubes in a rubber or plastic insulator, removed here for clarity. The double tubes are linked together and used mainly for joining three or four wires. This is a special tool for inserting bullets. But you can push them in with a pair of needle nose pliers. If the bullet is a loose fit, you can nip up the tube, but it's better to replace it. It should be possible to remove a properly made bullet terminal by pulling gently on the wire, but don't pull hard or you will damage the connection. If it sticks, you may be able to grasp the bullet terminal with a pair of needle nose pliers. But if in any doubt, snip them off and replace everything. So, now we can do period correct wiring and terminations. What about the loom itself? How do we get the factory original look that we see on concourse cars and full rebuilds? Find out after the break. The factory original wiring loom cover is a woven cloth tube. You can't change or repair the wiring inside it. You can cut it off to get access, but you can't put it back. If you need to recover your loom, you can wrap it with one of the many plastic or cloth tapes available, but none of them resemble the original appearance. Of course, you can buy a new wiring loom, and that's going to look great. But will it do the job? 
Not all cars still follow the original wiring plan. You've probably got a power socket and perhaps a radio, maybe some gauges, reversing lights, fog lights, electric fan, revolving number plates and so on. Most loom manufacturers are happy to add on accessory wiring, but the cost soon mounts up. And there's always the possibility that you have a special requirement they can't accommodate. But there is a solution. You can strip the covering off a standard loom and add the modifications you need. Just use the minimum amount of tape necessary to keep everything in place. Now send it off to a good loom manufacturer and they'll run it through their binding machine. And hey presto, your own custom loom with an original factory appearance. Well, we're getting there. What else can we do to give the electrical system an original look? An alternator is a popular addition and you'll probably need it if you have any electrical extras, but it doesn't look authentic. What we need is an alternator that looks like a dynamo. Fortunately, these are available and are called dynators, dynamators, dynalites, or whatever the vendor decides to call them. If you fit one of these or an alternator, then you don't need the voltage control box. You can leave it in place for appearance sake, or you can buy a dummy one that doubles up as an extra fuse box. One thing that spoils the look of many otherwise authentic looking cars is the battery. Modern sealed batteries are great, but they don't look like the battery that would have come off the production line. Again, help is at hand. This is a battery built with modern technology, but in an old rubber case. It came with black caps, but I managed to find some yellow ones and an Excite sticker on eBay. Well, I hope that's given you some ideas on how to enhance or repair your electrical system while retaining a factory original look. Thanks for watching and see you next time.